Grazie.
Okay, hello everybody. We're going to get started. Hey, welcome to the third breakout session of the day. Um, this session will be a split in half and have two different groups. Um, the first group as local illustrations of centering lived experience and data gathering and dissemination. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Molly to introduce ourselves. And um, just a reminder for folks that are attending virtually, if you wanna um, put any questions in the chat that we have somebody monitoring that. And- um, Does the video need to be on? <laughs> you can't see you, Merit, like at that thing. So. Yes. Get the tools. Because I cannot see the slide deck. Oh, your slide deck. You bring it up. So we can close. Yeah, there we, there we go. We're good. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Eric. All right. Everything seems okay otherwise? I think we're All good. Right. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. What a day so far. Wow. <laughs> Third set. Last session. Here we go. <laughs> Um, I'm Molly Lawrence, she, her, and I'm so pleased to be kicking off our panel. Here are our wonderful presenters. I'm going to uh, let them present or introduce themselves as they share in their own sections, and I'm so pleased to be kicking us off today um, and grounding our work together. This opportunity brought us together across several different disciplines and backgrounds um, on a topic that's important to us all. I want to thank the Center for Rural Studies, Carrie Daigle and Michael Moser, for uh, introducing Introducing us, and um, I also want to appreciate their ongoing partnership and contributions. Um, it felt appropriate to begin with this quote from a powerful book I've been reading. Um, thank you to Vera Sheehan for her powerful presentation at last year's summit and this book recommendation. Um, and I uh, really want to ground us um, again in research as an opportunity and a process for knowledge production. Um, and so uh, today, again, has been so inspiring, and it is at each summit to learn from practitioners like yourselves about new and inclusive data ga gathering and communication approaches that are centering lived experience and contributing towards sharing a richer, more dynamic story of health in our community. So I want to just spend a minute to ground our presentation in some of the essential principles that you see here on the screen for advancing health equity research that our panel has curated. And as you're listening today to uh, our panel, I invite you to make note when these principles are being incorporated. And also at the end, Sarah is going to facilitate a discussion. So please share your own work um, and how um, this is showing up for you or eager to learn from you, hear your stories. Um, so firstly, we know that racial and cultural histories matter and it's so essential to invest the time and the energy to listen and learn how experiences ripple outward um, impacting present day. We work to honor people's stories and experiences shared, um, and it's a privilege to hear these stories. Uh, we know that participant-centered, co-designed, um, and culturally sensitive approaches, uh, approaches really requires to be planful and intentional. And um, yes, go ahead. So high. It's like one, one million degrees. <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah, sorry, you're good. You're good. Just... Okay. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you for turning the heat off, too. I'm like, um, <laughs> then I want, um, I'm sorry, where were we? Um, and then moving into you know, our, our work, so many of your work in the room, I'm sure you know, we're inviting authentic engagement and fuller participation. Exciting. It's so exciting how that can lead to action oriented, more impactful findings. Um, for example, with our community health needs assessment process, our team, it really expanded the definition of health. So looking at factors like spiritual and religious beliefs and how those can affect health decisions. Um, moving into addressing power dynamics, for example, it's so important to acknowledge um, existing mistrust in longstanding institutions that we may be representing as we're doing work with community. Um, and then finally, the importance of designing accessible health literate communications. Um, so pictured here on this slide uh, is one of our piloted plain language summaries. Thank you to Chrissy Keating who's in the room and Ashley Kutcher uh, for their design work and designer Jeff Lehner. Um, so the intention of, of this plain language opportunity was to share back our findings in a digestible um, way with our focus group participants. So we're seeking feedback on this new design um, and really uh, looking to get uh, 
it, to take this as an opportunity to pilot in other projects as well. So it's so important to that point to test for understanding and ensure that our communications and our communication approaches are resonating with communities we're working with. Um, and then, you know, of course, language is an opportunity to bridge a connection and a shared understanding. And with that, I'll transition it to you, Ashley. Thank you, Molly. Really happy to be here today. I'm Ashley Kucher. I'm a speech language pathologist and have worked in this community for um, quite a number of years um, in both the medical setting, also in um, uh, early education settings, and most recently in private practice as well. Um, and so I have worked um, in the area of communication sciences and disorders for over 25 years largely in the medical context, as I said, where this work also includes advocacy for healthcare access and individual-centered care. In my role, I work with individuals who have acute changes in communication and thinking due to an injury, as well as folks who have differences in communication and thinking secondary to developmental disabilities. So during the pandemic, when the model of care shifted to online through telemedicine and other means, this brought with it a myriad of issues that understandably no one had time to consider until post-pandemic, many of which were of interest to me in terms of their impact on the individuals with whom I work most closely. So for example, what are the different communication and cognitive demands between in-person visits and telemedicine visits, and what accommodations are there available to assist those with communication disabilities? What are the cognitive demands of accessing the technology for telemedicine alone? And once the pandemic was over, was it right to assume that we should return to all in-person visits, or were there reasons to stick with remote and what clinical situations and for which persons indicated which sort of service would be better? And then who is studying and making the decisions about all of these issues? So I was honored to get to be a part of a pilot project, which was much bigger than myself. And I wanna continue Molly's tribute to those that were really involved. Principal investigator was Dr. Beth Zygmunt from UVMMC, UVM Medical Center, and um, Molly Lawrence from Community Health Improvement, and also, as Molly mentioned, the Center for Rural Studies. Um, I also wanna make sure I mention Chrissy Keating, who, as Molly said, was a key part of helping design some of our plain language um, tools and dissemination tools. The pilot project aimed to reveal and better understand the experiences, preferences, and resource needs of underserved and marginalized populations in using telemedicine. Given the opportunity to scale digital health visits, this research sought to explore knowledge gaps regarding disparities in access, such as technology availability, digital literacy, and communication accessibility. The hope being to gain a fuller picture of barriers and opportunities for accessing telemedicine to share with hospital administrators in charge of scaling future efforts with telemedicine. So five focus groups with strategically identified populations were organized, and the selection of those groups was informed by knowledge gained from review of baseline data on digital health services, key informant interviews, and project team and stakeholder input. I'm only going to speak to one of these focus groups today. This was a group held with individuals who identified as having a communication and or a thinking disability. So important key community partners were identified, which included researchers with expertise collaborating with autistic individuals, other agencies serving these individuals, including the UVM Speech and Hearing Clinic and the Center for Disability and Community Inclusion and Green Mountain Self-Advocates. Green Mountain Self-Advocates is for people with developmental disabilities to educate peers, to take control over their own lives, make decisions, solve problems, and speak for themselves. Another purpose of Green Mountain Self-Advocates is to educate and make the public aware of the strengths, rights, wants, and needs of people with developmental disabilities. So these community partners assisted with designing a description of the research and an invitation that was in plain language 
And they also helped with development of strategies for facilitation of the focus group to be optimally accessible. And then I served as a facilitator using my expertise in communication and thinking disabilities. And the strategies we employed included plain language questions with repetition as needed, a slower overall pace to the communication, frequent check-ins to monitor for questions, ensure understanding, and paraphrase in plain language as needed, as well as monitoring for communication break breakdowns and jargon busting. So as we all, we mentioned, using guidelines and principle for universal design, a plain language visually accessible summary was created. Molly alluded to that and showed that on a previous slide. And we have a few copies just as examples of that. Each one of the focus groups had a summary developed in a similar manner. Um, in the focus group with these individuals with communication and thinking disabilities and the use of the aforementioned strategies, we had good participation from all individuals and one care partner who also participated in the group. And overall, the group reported positive benefits of telehealth. So what we heard was that this saved participants time and effort of traveling to appointments. It helped with fewer missed appointments, which saved them money for cancellation costs. Telemedicine was preferred because for many of them, their chronic illnesses meant that doing, doing visits from the comfort of their own home was preferable and telemedicine allowed for that. And the support person in the group shared that telemedicine allowed them to be more involved in the person's care and allowed them to assist with technology needs during the appointment. Participants did mention that they sometimes experienced technical challenges as well as had a hard time processing information during telemedicine visits, and that sometimes those challenges could cause anxiety. So takeaways were that accessible and inclusive technological support for telemedicine visits is really helpful and necessary. Telemedicine does reduce time and effort and anxiety around traveling to in-person appointments. Telemedicine allows people to have medical appointments in a more comfortable environment of their own home where they can possibly have care partners more easily and jo join them to assist with either processing needs or technological needs. The input of the community partners that we, that we engaged with allowed us to connect very directly with the group of people that we wanted to hear from in a way that felt inclusive and accessible to this group of folks. And the addition of myself as a facilitator with knowledge and skill in communication and thinking disabilities increased the knowledge of the research team and ensured full participation from focus group members. Future research would be best to include members of this group of folks who identify with communication and thinking disabilities to ensure that the questions that are most important to them are actually what's leading the research and leading the design. And now I'm going to turn it over to Hulisa to talk about her project. Hi, everyone. My name is Hulisa. I'm a community health worker with the UVM Extension Program, Bridges to Health, where we help connect migrant workers to health and social services throughout the state of Vermont. I am also a part-time grad student in the Community Development and Applied Economics Program, and today I'm going to be uh, talking about the research I've been conducting for my thesis uh, with migrant workers, which explores the effects of migration on health and the body through art, as you can see some examples here posted to the wall. Uh, so just a little background. Today, there's over 1,200 Latino migrant workers in Vermont. These workers hail from countries such as Mexico, Guatemala, Ecuador, and the vast majority of these workers are undocumented. Uh, these individuals face many different barriers to accessing healthcare, from language and transportation to documentation status and ineligibility to healthcare, and the list goes on. Now, in terms of research on migrant health, uh, nationally and locally, um, research typically focuses on health upon arrival, uh, such as identifying barriers to accessing healthcare in the U.S. and identifying current health needs. And while these insights are crucial and needed to informing health equity programs and policy, there's notably less focus on uh, in the research on the origin of these health issues and how they've evolved as migrants move from their homeland to the U.S. So the study attempts to fill that gap 
um, through documenting these health journeys across the entire migration cycle, specifically by sharing stories through art. I um, also want to say a big inspiration for the methods used in this project was a project called uh, The Most Costly Journey or El Viaje Mescaro, which features migrant stories illustrated, illustrated by local Vermont cartoon artists. So, as I mentioned before, this project explores how the entire migration cycle impacts health. Um, contrary to popular belief, migration isn't just solely a movement from point A to point B, but in reality, migration is a multi-stage cycle. Uh, there's actually four specific phases that make up the migration cycle. First, there's pre-departure, which is essentially just time and country of origin. Second is uh, migration, the actual journey and the actual movement. Third is arrival and country of destination. And fourth is return to country of origin. So throughout each stage of migration, individuals have and create various experiences that influence their health in the next stage. Uh, this idea that one stage in life influences the next is known as the life course approach, uh, which grounds this research. The life course approach examines how people's lives are shaped by the sum of social, economic, and environmental factors across their lifespan. And by tracking these health journeys across time and space, researchers and practitioners can gain a fuller picture of the health realities migrants are experiencing, viewing health inequities as a continuum rather than as an isolated event. So to best explore the impacts of migration on the body, a methodology called body mapping is used in this study. Uh, body mapping is a pretty new qualitative method in which participants create life-size maps of their bodies uh, through drawing to visually represent aspects of their lives, uh, their bodies, and the world that they live in. It was first used in 2002 in South Africa in a project with women with HIV, uh, as a therapeutic art tool to narrate their life stories. Now it's used as a tool for advocacy, education, and what? Body mapping gives participants an alternative way to express their experiences versus only verbal expressions seen in traditional semi-structured interviews that are often used. And this can be particularly useful uh, for exploring sensitive topics that might be hard to talk about. Uh, body maps have also been shown to lessen power imbalances between the participant and the researcher, foster authentic dialogue, and improve social emotional health and help participants respond on a systemic level to the inequalities they're experiencing. Uh, so the following slides, I have some examples of the body maps that have been collected by participants. Uh, research participants each have to create three body maps in order uh, to represent the phases of migration they went through, um, which would be pre-departure phase um, in time in country of origin, the migration phase and the arrival phase. And participants are compensated $75 per meeting, uh, making a total of $150 after the study is complete. Um, these sessions do take a very long time uh, to do with people. So it takes about six hours total. So that's about $25 an hour that people are paid. Um, so here we have our first body map that shows an individual during their time and country of origin. To create the outline of the body, I have participants lay down on these big pieces, pieces of paper and think of a position that best describes them during their time uh, in this, during this time in their life. And they choose a color to outline their body in as well. Uh, this individual chose a position that's supposed to symbolize him running from jobs to home, um, also a lot of exercise that he did in country of origin. And it's kind of hard to see, but he outlined himself in red, which is uh, to him symbol, uh, symbolizing the poverty um, in his country of origin. And this tracing and color selection happens in every single map. Um, then he was asked to draw things outside of the body that represents his life in his country of origin. First, just general things that come to mind. Um, so like a lot of people, for instance, draw their house where they grew up. Um, and then participants are asked to draw outside of their body things that represent challenges and also support systems or positive things as well. Um, and then on the inside of the body, people are asked to draw something that I call marks. Um, there's two kinds of marks that I ask participants to draw on each map. First are physical marks, such as injuries and illnesses that affected them during this time. And then there's the emotional marks. Uh, for instance, in this map, he drew a heart to symbolize happiness um, that he was feeling. And also like a danger sign to represent a hip injury that he experienced. 
And then I ask participants finally to draw connections to the things outside of the body, to the things inside, if they feel they're connected. Um, then this whole process, same set of questions is repeated for the next map. Um, as I said, there's three different maps. This one is on the actual migration journey. Um, so this individual, it's kind of hard to tell, but they are in what uh, is supposed to symbolize a running position. Um, and their bodies outlined in black to symbolize the fear that they felt. Uh, a lot of participants in their second map often choose to draw the steps um, or like the exact routes that they took in order to arrive at the U.S. Um, so far, there's a pretty even divide between people who went through the desert and people who went um, through more forested hill areas. Um, but we can see this person went through the desert. Uh, after he crossed the river, seen on the side, um, it looks like this individual also suffered from some injuries by stepping on a cactus. And then we can also see stress lines that he drew in his head uh, that he was experiencing during migration as well. Um, and then in the third map and final map, this participant details his time in Vermont and his health in Vermont. This map was really interesting because this person in particular suffered from cancer. Um, so we can see on the inside, he drew a lot of different symbols. Um, first, there's these Zs, and that's supposed to rec uh, symbolize fatigue. Uh, these little like droplets are supposed to symbolize sweat. And the lines, like the squiggly lines, are supposed to symbolize chills. And those are all symptoms he experienced during chemotherapy. Uh, he also drew people on the outside having difficulty communicating. Um, that was from a specific story that he told me when he first arrived at the hospital, trying to find the um, cancer department that he needed to get treatment from and telling me how difficult it was until he ran into an interpreter. Um, and then fear of death, um, that was something he felt when he was first diagnosed and he thought he might die. Um, but these body maps are pretty powerful stories. Um, it's created by the participants. I don't touch them. I really just ask a set of questions and then it's really just a conversation that we have back and forth. Um, the first time we meet, it's usually like three hours. The second time we meet, two and a half hours to three hours. Um, and I also want to stress that it seems like there's a lot of suffering in these maps, but there's also exercises in which people are supposed to highlight areas of personal strength that they feel within themselves and in their bodies and that they're able to call on in these times of need. But that is my research and I'm going to hand it off to Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Heiss. I'm an associate professor at the University of Vermont, and I teach in the College of Ag and Life Sciences. And specifically, I teach classes related to communication and research. Um, I am a part of this panel today a little bit because of my research, a lot of it because of my teaching. Specifically, I teach a class called Inclusive Science Communication, where we talk about the different ways in which we can identify, evaluate, and create inclusive communication messages. Uh, today, I'm not going to present on my teaching, but just to tell you that that class is out there and it accepts undergrads through graduate students. Um, Today, our panelists wanted to share with you some of their experiences in terms of creating um, and advancing health equity research and communication campaigns. We also wanna recognize the fact that there's a lot of expertise in this room and curiosity. We only have about three minutes left, so we might have a time for a question or two, but we would 100% invite you to email us after this panel or find us in the hallway and to talk more. We're really excited about these ideas and um, we're thinking about them, thinking about how to move forward. Is there anybody that would like to, I'm gonna invite the panelists to come up and with our two to three minutes, um, if anybody had a question or a comment, um, we would love to hear it. Test, test. Testing. Okay. I don't know. Oh, I can. Yeah, yes. Any questions? Thoughts for future? Things we should consider? Oh, it's really three o'clock. It's really it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
I think it's okay to close and allow people to have time for a break before the next session too. If you would like to chat with any of us up front, look at Lisa's uh, research posters um, or talk to us out in the hallway, that would be great. And again, emailing us would be a wonderful opportunity to connect. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, so I'd like to invite the next room to come up. We have Walking the Walk, Enhancing Diversity and Inclusion in the Recruitment and Retention process. Okay. Okay. For to stand here and use this, or if you want to walk around, oh, yeah, you just, just need to go to your cup of coffee and jack and all the things. What's that? Um, you just have to turn this out right here. Um, just making sure I've got. Okay. It should be able to see it out of that one. And then just head starts. Okay, there you go. Okay, it starts. Good. Yeah, you're all set. You're all, you're set. all set everywhere else. So it oh, works. We're good. good. Okay. Great. That looks different than this. It does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Tinotenda Rutanira. I am co executive director and co founder of the Vermont Professionals of Color Network. Oh, that's uh, here. Uh, and I'm Courtney Fleischer. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'm a pediatric psychologist in the University of Vermont Medical Center's Psychological Services Department. I can just hit that. Thank you. Sure. Sure. I'll just click there. Nope. I can't click there. Okay. No, it's not sure. Yeah, it's about to be the same. It's a fancy transition. Give me a lot of these great. Um, okay. Is it in person? Right mm here. -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that works. Okay. Let's go back to Okay. So what's up? Okay, so um, I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but how many of you remember uh, this Reese's Peanut Butter Cup commercial from the early 80s? I'm going to show it. Can you see this? No. How do I get to the... Just keep clicking. I think it's like a delayed, like a add-on. I'm in a different... I'm, I'm online now because I couldn't... So it is okay. Just to stop sharing. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Um, Do I have to stop sharing? I'm. Uh, Do that, Jeff. Okay, good. That works. Okay, yeah. that works. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, I might just. That's okay. No, it's, it's there. But you can't. Um, I know if it's going to. Okay. Um, there we go. There we go. And and play. Hopefully, the video. Oh gosh, they do not make this easy, do they? Oh shoot. Yes, they'll confident you, but if you want me to call for backup, I can. I mean, call for backup. If they get here, we figured it out. She clicked on it before, right? You can't click, like, the, it doesn't do the embedded thing. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. Did, did you have to hold this down? It's, sorry. Sorry. It all down. it's down. This one? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Is it back up again? Is it up in the corner? It flashed up and then it went back. Okay. Oh, I need to check more time. Oh, there, you there, 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 there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's get it. Well, I know, but I'm looking there. at it. Yeah, there we go. Mmm, chocolate. Mmm, <laughs> peanut butter. Hey! Oh, you... Peanut butter on my chocolate. What? <laughs> what? Delicious. Two great tastes that taste great together. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Real milk chocolate, delicious peanut butter. Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. And Reese's Crunchy Peanut Butter Cups, topped with chopped peanuts. That's cool. Okay, now we want to go. Now I gotta go. Peanut butter. Chocolate. 
think we should be splitting up. Right. And then you should feel the click now through the presentation. Okay. So I think the next one, I'm sorry, do this one. Thanks. Okay. So Yes. Okay. Is this okay? Yes. Um, except it's not in presentations. Like I can't see it. Uh, this was a lot of work to just show the stupid little commercial. Which is not I do for beginning issue. I don't have to give a presentation. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, that one. I'm in there. 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 I'm I know, right? So hold it, bro. It broke the system. Just the class, it's only that. Just break the end, yeah. So we should have that next one. Yeah. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so we'd like to, after all of that, uh, we'd like to share how an encounter at last year's uh, summit turned into a generative collaboration um, that's mutually beneficial for our respective contexts and for the experience of residency applicants, um, how we are walking the walk together uh, in the in the DEI realm. So you might be wondering like uh, who and what is the Vermont Professionals of Color Network? Um, it's an organization whose mission is to improve the professional, economic and social representation, success and prosperity of black and brown uh, entrepreneurs and professionals in the state of Vermont. Uh, we believe that opportunities come with uh, opportunities to climb the economic ladder and that a prosperous BIPOC community is a good thing for all Vermont. Um, and to speak a little bit about um, my part of the collaboration, so uh, internship is psychology's residency corollary. Um, so it's a full-time nationally matching, uh, nationally matched training experience. Uh, in the 2019-2020 academic year, um, the Uni University of Vermont Psychological Services trained our first a class of residents in over 15 years uh, in our new um, American Psychological Association accredited program. Uh, our learners join us at the level uh, that's kind of equivalent to a PGY3 um, with regard to their clinical experience and their independence. But unlike, unlike in medicine, um, a successful completion of the residency is a, is, um, a prerequisite for, for graduation. And so um, when we met last this time last year, um, Courtney and I just kind of started chatting. And like you saw in the commercial, we kind of became to be M1 and our minds melted. And we were like, well, you know, there's this program that we run. And I was explaining to her what Newcomer Nexus was. And essentially what Newcomer Nexus is, is a program that we've developed for uh, organizations uh, where, you know, when you look outside and you look at the talent pool in Vermont, it's very shallow. And so organizations are looking outside the state, looking for how do we attract more people to Vermont? How do we get them to relocate to Vermont? And if it's a white person living in Pittsburgh, it's an easy conversation to have to be like, yeah, move to Vermont. White people want to move, move to move to Vermont. <laughs> uh, but a, a white recruiter talking to a person of color in Pittsburgh, it's a whole different conversation to ask somebody to uproot their family and move to the third whitest country, third whitest state in the country. And so essentially what Newcomer Nexus does, it's a two-part program. First part is on the recruitment side, where we try to help organizations recruit people of color. And when they're having those conversations, we then come in 
on behalf of that organization and talk to that individual about what it's really like to live in Vermont as a person of color. And so we talk, we also make the case for, you know, like the challenges that are associated with living in Vermont as a person of color, but also why some of us have chosen to live here for 15, 20, 30 years at a time. And so we make that sell to that individual. If we're successful at that, we then uh, hope that that individual then decides, okay, let's 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 move to Vermont, you know. And so what typically happens is that that person moves to Vermont on a cold, wet Wednesday, and they jumped in Colchester, you know, in the middle of February, and you know, hey, we'll see you on Monday. And so what typically happens then is that that person, if you fast forward two, three months, they look around and they just are like, I don't know anybody. I'm lonely. I'm isolated. I haven't met people of color. I don't even know where to get my hair braided, et cetera, et cetera. And so what our Newcomer Nexus program does is we pair that person with an ambassador who then is tasked with ensuring that for the first three months of that person's stay in Vermont, they know where to get their hair braided. They understand why we put our wipers up when it snows. They are introduced to the local imam if they're Muslim, or they're invited to they're invited to Shelburne museums or Shelburne farms to do apple picking. That sort of stuff is what uh, the Newcomer Nexus program is all about. And I'm going to back up a little bit because um, I wanted to speak a little bit more about the program, but I miss doing that. Uh, so just to, to speak about our, our training program um, at UVM uh, Medical Center in Psychology, um, our, our mission is to be providing generalist training, delivering services to rural populations. Um, and we have some more experience with specialized services, service areas um, to enhance our, our, our students' experiences of themselves as clinicians and to help them further um, their, their ideas about what they might want for their training and for their uh, career choices. Um, but our training staff, several people on our training staff were interested in centering cultural humility and uh, within our department. It was a way in which our department was growing at the time. And so we kind of embedded um, cultural humility and as foundational to our residency. And there are a few things that we have done as a program. Um, we have a, a year long DEI didactic uh, training experience. Um, we've integrated aspects of that program, of, of that training experience into, uh, as supervisors, a learning process that we have done to decolonize supervision practices. Um, and also we have a rotation in liberation psychology for our adult, uh, our adult residents. Uh, but we were, you know, in, in um, centering this aspect of our training program, we were aware that we needed to provide appropriate supports to our recruited BIPOC residents, but that that's challenging in our very white department, in our very white state. Um, some of our residents, some of our uh, BIPOC residents in the past have shared some of their racist experiences. For example, one of our residents was mistaken for an environmental services a worker, despite not wearing that uniform and wearing a, a badge with a badge buddy that said um, they were a psychology resident. Uh, and we have another resident who um, had patients and staff commenting on their accent and asking to work with another clinician. Um, this individual felt really welcomed and supported in our department, uh, different from other experiences that this person had had um, in their American education, uh, but their partner couldn't find community. And so they left the area rather than enhancing our department and our professional community in terms of diversity. Okay. So, so let's talk about then what happened when we uh, decided to partner, and so we ran into each other in the commercial. And ran into each other in the commercial. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, with the newcomer nexus as part of the residency program, we then established our initial panel discussion with the goal, really, of creating. Oh, actually, got one. We got all sorts of stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, and so with the goal of um, creating that sense of recruitment, uh, inclusion and belonging, 
And so really what we wanted to do is then create a panel discussion for these folks uh, who were candidates to become resident doctors here um, when they were doing the interviews and really give them an opportunity to be able to ask questions about what it's really like to live in Vermont. Because as they're making these sort of like life changing decisions about where do I want to do my residency, which school appeals to me, they're also having thoughts about, you know, what will I be able to do if I move to Vermont? What will I, what will life be like? Uh, how will I interact with other people? Is it true that there's not a lot of people of color in Vermont? What's Clinton's like? You know, all those kind of questions um, that anybody would ask when they're relocating here, those are all kind of more pronounced when it's a person of color because of the lack of divert diversity that is within Vermont. And so what we did with the, with the panels, we found folks within the BIPOC community that sort of mirrored the educational levels of these potential candidates, as well as sort of um, their lived experience would be. And we then uh, got these, these panelists to then answer questions um, on behalf of sort of the BIPOC community to these uh, potential candidates. And for our part, um, for our program, it was important for us to allow interviewees to have um, access to honest and non-evaluative conversations so that they could inform their decision-making process around um, where they wanted to rank our program uh, in, their, in their list for their matching. Uh, and we also wanted to collect data about um, the impact of this, inter of this um, process. And then um, the second part of that program was then to do the ambassadorship program, which is to ensure that we have a goal of retaining these folks if they came here, that they would have sort of a success story that we could point to. And so um, the, the goal of that was then to make sure that we, we build a community for them so that when they come, and we assign an ambassador to them, that ambassador would be able to, again, like I said, show them where to get their hair done or take them to, you know, ethnic uh, grocery stores so that they know, you know, where they can get specific types of foods and stuff. And so the goal of all of this was just to also change the narrative about Vermont because if we aren't the ones who are talking and changing the narrative about Vermont, then it's up to people like on Saturday Night Live. You guys know the skit about Vermont, right? Oh, yes. Those are people that are talk telling the narrative about Vermont. And yet what we want to try and do is change that narrative by giving people that are coming to Vermont. I mean, I can talk about Vermont all day, but what I, I cannot convince somebody because I've lived here for 20 years. And yet new people that are coming here and having these experiences and going out ice, ice fishing for the first time, snowmobiling, going mountain biking, all of that stuff, those are experiences that they're going to post on Instagram and Facebook and on LinkedIn and really showcase the, the sort of the life that you can choose to live here should you choose to live here. And, uh, and what we mean by everybody wins is the fact that us as we TPOC win because we've got more people of color coming to Vermont. Uh, UVM Health Network or UVMMC wins because they have a positive outcome on how they are attracting people and they fill some of their diversity quotas. And then the candidates themselves who then become residents here have like a success story that they can go back and talk about Vermont uh, during Thanksgiving, Christmas breaks and so on. They are going back to their homes and talking about what an incredible experience they're having in Vermont. And then that therefore changes the narrative about what life is like here in Vermont. And additionally, the other people who win are our patients, uh, because then we have um, patients who are experiencing healthcare from providers who look like them. Uh, and, you know, the increasing um, diversity in the way that we think and the creative ideas that we come up with, uh, with a more diverse um, staff. Uh, so also what we were hoping for our residents was that the ambassador program would offer a sense of community resources and activities that Tina was talking about. Um, also ex uh, increased access to professionals of color with lived experience that our mostly white supervising team would not really be able to provide. And hopefully this would result in like reducing isolation and loneliness in their experiences um, and increasing a sense of inclusion and belonging while being here. So to share uh, some of our 
data from this first year that we've done this project, we had over 130 applicants for our four residency spots in this past year, and we interviewed 34 applicants. Uh, we had um, a one-time panel discussion per round. We participated in two rounds of the match, uh, but we had multiple interview dates. So it was just identified at a particular time and um, uh, applicants were invited to, to join. 28.5% um, of our applicants took part. Uh, there were four panelists in each discussion session, so a total of eight panelists. We used SurveyMonkey to collect data and we had a 60% response rate. Um, SurveyMonkey also let us know that it took about five and a half minutes to complete a, this five question um, uh, survey with a few five point Likert scale questions and some free text questions. Um, you can see that all of our participants um, reported that they either found the uh, the, the process, the panel discussion, extremely or very helpful in their decision-making process. There was a little bit more um, variance in the convenience of the time of day that the, um, that the panel discussions were offered. That's, of course, a bit more of a challenge when you're dealing with um, a nationwide match system and you're trying to manage uh, different schedules and such. And then um, a few qualitative questions. So people, our, our applicants really enjoyed this experience. They found it to be valuable. They appreciated panel members, the space for, and on, for an honesty, the space for and honesty of conversations about living in Vermont in the BIPOC community and having different perspectives. One of our respondents said that it felt very welcoming and warm. Most of our responses for things that they least liked were nothing or they didn't know. One respondent suggested that more time for applicants to ask questions would be helpful. And just for frame of reference, time was available to uh, ask questions. Um, but when asking about what could be improved, we kind of learned a little bit more about um, what may have been some of the challenge to that. So um, applicants may not have felt comfortable uh, answer or asking questions. In terms of um, beneficial, in terms of um, suggestions for improvement, we had some beneficial suggestions, including the idea that um, applicants be able to submit questions in advance anonymously, uh, and also panelists discussing experience of BIPOC residents in healthcare settings. Um, but most importantly, um, this Quote, I think this is a wonderful and unique panel to have for residency. I've not had any place offer something like this. Captured exactly what we were aiming for and it was really gratifying to have that kind of response. Um, in terms of uh, budgetary considerations, um, this was a pilot program. So we didn't really expect to sort of charge a full fee for, for the services that we were offering uh, the psychological services department. Um, however, uh, we are looking at potentially kind of going beyond just the pilot and doing this across multiple uh, residency programs. And uh, our goal really is to make sure that uh, we get fair and just compensation, uh, acknowledging that uh, Courtney's department really took kind of a chance on us uh, in trying something new that had never actually been done. And so when we did it this year with the, with the psychology services department, we we weren't expecting to like charge for fees or anything like that. And all we tried to do was just make sure that the panelists that we used and the potential um, uh, ambassadors that we used would be pay paid adequately and fairly. So as we're looking to expand and grow the program, uh, we're hoping that maybe perhaps we will be able to, to um, adequately compensate some of the panelists and ensure that uh, the program that we're service serving is a win for all, all involved. Um, so Tino alluded to uh, the next steps. It, it was very important from our department's perspective as well to be able to compensate for um, panelists' time, for Tino's time in putting this together. Um, but 
what we recognize is that we have um, a, a pretty cool concept. Um, we have other departments across the uh, hospital that have similar needs in their in their programs, um, but that our financial resources as a single department are not enough to sustain this program. Uh, and so we are looking to expand um, involvement. We've contacted a few residency programs, pediatrics, uh, also a pediatric fellowship program, um, psychiatry residency, as well as their fellowship program in the family medicine um, residency uh, as examples of departments that we know have prioritized DEI initiatives and felt that they would be like-minded in their thoughts about um, involving uh, this process in their recruitment in their recruitment process. And so that allows us to pool our resources for a more cost-effective um, experience, which would allow us hopefully to be able to, to pay a reasonable, um, fair, fair fee. <laughs> um, so what does it mean really to, to, to help departments that are prioritizing the DI objectives? Um, for us, we really are trying to find departments and programs that are prepared to walk the walk. Um, it's about going beyond well-intentioned statements on websites and stickers for BLM and all of that kind of stuff, and actually doing the work that it takes to, to make a difference, to make a real concrete difference. Um, as an organization, we want, um, we want accomplices as opposed to allies. Um, allies are people that kind of ask like, how do you want us to help you? What can we do to help? And so on and so forth. And whereas accomplices, uh, emotively, you kind of think of like something involving like a crime, right? Um, and essentially, like, that's kind of what we want emotively. Like if I was to call Courtney at three o'clock in the morning and be like, hey, Courtney, I need you to be my accomplice. Like, what's Courtney going to do? She's going to like, get out of bed and say, whose car are we taking? Like, I'm in it. I'm like, I'm you know, dead. I'm already you know, you know, <laughs> so Grabbing her favorite baseball bat and like knowing that whatever shenanigans I'm up to, she's in it with me. That's an accomplice. Whereas like if I called Courtney at three o'clock in the morning and asked her like, Courtney, I need you to be my, my ally. Emotively, Courtney's like, yeah, what can I do to help? You know, she doesn't get out of bed. She's like, Call me in the morning, like when you need, when you know what you need, right? And so that's really what we want to try and do with this program and with other programs where we are challenging organizations that, yeah, putting stuff on a website is awesome. Maybe holding an event every now and again is, is cool, but really we want, we want organizations to put their money where their mouth is and to walk the walk. And if, if DAI is an important aspect of your organization in the same way that maybe accounting is or bio or, or the legal department and so on, then it needs to be something that organizations put money into. And so I'm really proud and appreciative of Courtney and her department for really kind of stepping up and taking this risk on us. And we've proven that this, all, this, this uh, program works. And we're hoping that as more and more folks of color are attracted to states like Vermont, we've got programs that help them to make that decision that Vermont is a place that they can call home. Okay. Are there any other questions? Ideas? Yeah. Why don't you need that one for you, actually? I don't think Hi, my name is Betsy Brown. I use she for pronouns. Um, I work for UDMNC at the Meeting Switch Board. I'm also a proud member of UDMNC Sports Staff United Union. Um, we won our first contract last year. We did really well. So I guess it's not so much of a question, but a challenge or a caution. Um, I I think your project sounds wonderful, and I think if it grows, that would be great. Um, I think that 
you're talking about two very different things when it comes to recruitment and retention. Okay, and it sounds like you did a great job with recruitment, and I think in some cases the hospital's doing a great job with recruitment. We have two of the departments in our union have the greatest number of people of color as employees. And so, yeah, someone did a great job recruiting them. I am one of the grievance co-chairs for our union. And in the last year, I've worked on a number of grievances for people of color who are not, you know, getting what they should be getting. Um, some of them are being discriminated against. Um, they're not being treated with respect. And so I think if you don't pay attention to the retention, the recruitment doesn't mean anything. Thank you for that comment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, I, I do think that what we are doing is a part of the process. It is not the full picture. I think that um, the ambassador program is really an opportunity and uh, a way in to work towards. I mean, that is part of the retention component. Um, I, I think that it's well beyond uh, the scope of our specific project, but it's a way um, to to make that happen. And I I I resonate with what you're saying. That was the experience of residents that we have had, and and why we are working to explore ways to to make this a more welcoming community, make this a more welcoming um, space to work and to be. Um, but thank you. Do you have Being that uh, I just want to go with Bessie saying, um, I think a lot of the time we say retention, recruitment, recruitment, and retention, but it should be retention first and recruitment. We should be second, trying to retain mm -hmm. the people that we have. We've we done a, put a lot of energy, energy, energy into getting these people here. And then once they're here, we don't do a good job of keeping them here, making them feel safe, making them feel respected. Now, that's not you guys' fault. We still need you guys to have those great folks to, to for money. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if you have um, a, a role in retaining folks to try to bring. I think that role is on people like myself. That's, I would love to, to have an opportunity to partner with you, figure out what we can do to help keep the people that we have here, um, that we work so hard to get here, and uh, to make them get respected. As a person of color, I have also been disrespected at work. I have also been. Uh, a target of micro um, micro aggressive network. So it's just not, and if I can go through it, imagine what my EBS uh, workers are going through. So I would love to have an opportunity to speak with you maybe to work together and figure out what can you do um, to have retained most of the have. We have We have great people. And, and I do applaud you guys for the effort. You know, I, I don't know who's peanut butter and chocolate, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> Appreciate it, but you guys, I, because when I got here, November of 2020, I would have loved to have an opportunity for somebody to say, hey, man, uh, this is where you can shop. This is where you can get your car look that. This is where you can do this. This is where you can do that. I sat in the hotel alone for like seven months. I got here in November. I didn't really get out until April when I met BTVOC. And then that's when I started being introduced to community here. And once you have community, it is easier to stay here. But for me, it was, I had to go to my SPO at the time or CO at the time and say, hey, man, I can't stay here. I've got to go. I can't stay here. I can't find housing and I have no community here. And um, he stepped in and helped me find some housing. And then you guys stepped in and helped me build community. So, um, I hope the program can be for uh, a spectrum of people uh, from entry level to executives trying to get people to come here and show you. Thank you. Um, have you guys thought about including the College of uh, Medicine in the 
just because there's so much overlap in the professors and you know, who runs those who runs those programs and you know they're trying to recruit a different student yeah. body and obviously there's you know um, other factors related to Supreme Court decisions yada yada but it doesn't mean we can't still have social panels like this think or excludes uh, these types of opportunities and potential for prospective students for like their school who are then going to be here for four years and then they want to stick around after and so yeah thank you um definitely an option and an opportunity um had a few conversations um with anisha ramal who's sadly not here anymore, um, but uh, she's been involved in the process of um, some recruitment retention processes at the medical school level. Um, but yeah, I think that this could be absolutely something uh, that's expanded in that realm. Um, one of the things about expanding to residency and fellowship programs at this point in time is that we're on a similar um, cycle in terms of when we interview and when we um, would be offering the panel discussions. So I think that's a it, it it lends itself well to the first step in terms of pooling our resources. Um, but absolutely, I mean, you know, we've talked about like we would love this to be at the broad scale level. Uh, and yeah, so baby steps and keep moving forward. Thank you so much, Courtney and Tina. Thank you for the first group as well that came on. Really important work, really fascinating work. And um, uh, thank you all for coming. I want to invite everybody to please attend the last closing section uh, session downstairs in the ex exhibition hall. It's um, takeaways and call to action and just a nice way to wrap up the day. So we hope that you will join um, us for that. We'll do all for that. Justin, can I ask you a question, a technical question? Why oh, I asked for it to me. I'll text for a second. I can ask. Okay. 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 Question for you. So I wasn't exactly sure how to do this, um, but when I'm on a slide and I want to like read from here, how do I go down and do it? Real resonated with Tina. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Congratulations Thank on the you. presentation. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Boy, that technical part. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Nailed it by the end. It's smooth. It's so important. I'm with these. Cheers in our direction. Sure. Gloria. Nice to meet you.